the associated terms with Arsenal were always, you know, speed, skill, style. Now I think it's more characteristic to talk about their mental fragility, their frailty on the field. Um, and for supporters, that's difficult because we all look for reasons to derive pride from our team. You know, we're all looking for bragging rights. We're all looking to boast. And at the moment, we are becoming a bit of a laughing stock of the Premier League. We are the, the crashing clown car that everybody wants to see. The neutrals love to watch Arsenal fall apart. And as a fan, that really hurts. I think it's been a steady decline. I think that when we first moved to the Emirates Stadium, we were put in a position financially, economically, where we had to make certain cuts, uh, cost-cutting measures. We had to pull things back financially to afford this place. Uh, and that took us from a team who were first or second. I mean, Arsene Wenger in the first 10 years of his reign was first or second pretty much without fail. Um, then we dropped to a team who were sort of regular Champions League qualifiers. And some people couldn't bear that. They found that infuriating, the perpetual race for fourth. I could see, I think, a bit more logic to it. I could see where the club was going because the plan was always, well, when we get the financial power back, we'll explode. You know, suddenly Arsene Wenger will be restored. We'll be back at the top of the table. Um, and that we should give Arsene that opportunity to spend that money. I think the unfortunate thing is, it's kind of twofold. We've regained that power and started spending again at a time when other clubs have far superior financial capacity that we didn't envisage happening. I think that was a mistake from the club that we, you know, we didn't see the huge injection of wealth that would come with Abramovich, with City, even with TV rights to an extent. But I also think that in a way the money has come too late for Arsene Wenger. The money has arrived at a point where he's being outstripped by his competitors. When you look at the Premier League now and you tried to rank the managers who perform the best with the resources they have, Arsene Wenger's not near the top there. He's probably down in mid-table somewhere. And it's unfortunate that just as Arsenal have regained their financial footing and are able to make an impact in the transfer market, they've got a coach who's coming towards, whose powers are waning. He's coming towards the end. Uh, and I think we're seeing that borne out in, in the way the team plays. I feel frustrated with the club. I feel frustrated with the club. I haven't given up on this club at all. You know, I never will. You're an Arsenal fan for life. You don't change that. Uh, and I see the potential of this club. I see that, you know, there's a huge fan base and a passionate fan base. You know, we're here talking about this, but people who care about this club, that much is evident. Whatever you think of the various people who commentate on Arsenal and the way they do it, they're doing it because they care. I really believe that, that everyone's a fan deep down, even if, even if they're protesting, even if they're holding up a banner, even if they're, they feel so sick about it, they can't go to the games anymore. That doesn't mean they're not a supporter. They love Arsenal, I really truly believe that. And with that, you know, we're one of the biggest teams in the Premier League, we're one of the biggest clubs in Europe still just about clinging on to that status. And I just think that there, there is such massive potential for us to, to go on and win things and not just win things, but create history, you know, create a culture, bring that back into the club, that pride in the way we play, that pride in the way we do things. And I think we're letting it slip. But it is there to be had and it's there to be done. So I'd say my overriding feeling about what the club, the position we're in at the moment is frustration because changes can be made. This is not irreversible. It just needs someone to grasp the nettle, to take hold of it. Uh, and that's what I desperately hope happens sooner rather than later. But since David Dean left the club, really, there's been an executive vacuum on the football side and that's needed to be filled. Quite why it's taken so long, we don't know. But I think we can assume the manager has been somewhat resistant to that change. I see these changes as kind of a weakening of his power base, a, a dissolution of his power, which I think is really important for the club. I think this kind of auto autonomy that he had at Arsenal was dangerous uh, and I think that omnipotence has held us back. Now there are different voices coming into the club and I think that will be the model we adopt moving forward. I don't think that we'll ever see a manager quite like Arsene Wenger again in terms of the sheer control he held over the football club. I think you're looking at Rouse and Yehi coming in to head up football operations, Sven Mislintat, who seems to be already playing a very active role in recruitment. And I think they'll be looking for a coach, someone who works under and with them, who's prepared to take on that influence, to take on that advice. And I think that crucially, that's going to give more accountability to the coach. I think that crucially, that means that 
you can sack a coach without having to completely reboot the football club, which is the situation we've been in for the last 20 years, that if Arsene Wenger went, that there was nobody there to replace him, no way of having any kind of continuity. Now, with that in place, if the coach isn't working out, he can go, we can keep the executives there, and it's just a way of moving the club forward. So I do feel really optimistic about that. Sorry, my eyes are watery, and I think it's going to look like I'm just crying through the interview, <laughs> which probably would be good for the film. But I just need to wipe it, sorry. No worries, mate. No worries. I think the ownership is a big issue, and actually the manager is the most immediate issue and the most resolvable. But I think that that detracts a little from how problematic the ownership situation is. Um, Stan's silence is his most famous characteristic. I think it's also possibly his most dangerous. You know, last season, from everything we hear, this board was not necessarily certain about backing Arsene Wenger. It was Stan who signed it off. So anything that's gone down this season, um, I think is on Stan, really. Because he's the man, ultimately, who had that lunch with Arsene Wenger, who handed in the new two-year deal. He made that call, and it's a conservative call. It's the call of a man who doesn't really care about being competitive, who cares primarily about the club ticking over, about the value of his investment increasing. And Arsene is a fairly capable pair of hands if you're, if you're interested in that. You know, he's a relatively consistent manager. I think that's what's infuriating about him for some supporters. But for Stan, Arsene's a, a conservative appointment who makes sense. I think we need to hear more from the owner we need to hear more from the board. They need to have an active voice. They cannot hide behind Arsene Wenger for too much longer. And soon Arsene Wenger will be gone. And if some of these problems continue at Arsenal beyond that point, they can be certain that the eye of the fans will turn on them. And justifiably so, justifiably so. Because we live in an environment now with the Premier League where owners are pushing their teams to be competitive. They're investing money in the club. Stan's taking money out of the club. He's certainly not putting any money in. And while I respect uh, our ambition to be self-funded, our ambition to live off our own resources. I do think that the, the passivity shown by the Arsenal ownership is a big contributing factor to some of the struggles we've recently had. Well, I was promised that when we sold Alexis Sanchez, we'd suddenly explode into being this brilliant free-flowing football team uh, who never gave the ball away. That hasn't quite happened. And I do think that as fans, we're guilty of kind of castigating a player when he wants to leave the club. For me, Alexis is, was the most exciting Arsenal player I've seen since Thierry Henry. And I don't say that lightly. I thought he was electric. He could produce something out of nothing. And frankly, that is exactly what this team needs because their interplay isn't good enough. So they need an individual, a maverick, who can just score from nothing because they don't create chances organically. So selling Alexis to a rival, it really stung. I think if he'd gone to Man City, I think we could have accepted it. We've sold players to them before. I'm thinking Adebayor, Torre, Nasri. There's a little bit of that relationship there. They, there's not the same history that there is with the United, which to fans of my generation was a huge, huge thing. So I was sorry to see him go, but I think I was more irritated about the flip-flopping of Arsenal's transfer policy. You know, we spent all summer saying we weren't going to sell him. And then on deadline day, tried to do the deal, couldn't get it done because we wanted Thomas Lamar for 90 million. It didn't happen. Then come January, having made the decision to, sell, to keep him on the day, we're suddenly willing to sell him again. N not only that, but Thomas Lamar, who we wanted for 9 million, 90 million three months ago, isn't even on the agenda. It feels like target shift. It feels like uh, policies shift constantly. And I think that can partially be explained by Mislintat coming in. Maybe, that, maybe he had a say in, in our January business. But again, it just seems like flailing around, a, a lack of direction. And I think that's the characteristic of Arsene Wenger's recent tenure, that it's firefighting. It's firefighting. It's dealing with an immediate problem with a short-term solution uh, that inevitably will fail. Everything's short-term. We bring in a guy who might work for a few games, but then is there a long-term plan for him? Did we know what we wanted Granit Xhaka to be when we signed him? When we signed Shkodran Mustafi, did we think he was the right partner for Lauren Koscielny or was he just the guy who was available at the time? When we signed Lucas Perez, did we really think that that was the right striker to get that summer, given that we loaned him out a year later and barely played him when we had him? And that's without speaking about Lacazette, who became the record signing of this club, and then by January is second choice. Something is very wrong in recruitment, and part of that's on Arsene Wenger. I think the scouting team have to take responsibility. And my hope is that the new guys in the backroom team, the likes of Missel and Tat, can fix that solution. But I, I tell you what, buying Aubameyang, for, who's 29, buying Mkhitaryan, 
who I think is 20, sorry, I'll say that again. I tell you what, buying Aubameyang, who's 28, 29, Mkhitaryan, 29, that's another short-term fix. That's another short-term fix. And unfortunately, we haven't got the team to support these guys. And it's very possible that they could go through the peak period of their career in an Arsenal team that's struggling in sixth or fifth or, God forbid, seventh. So this is a, something that needs fixing in the longer term. It needs a better scouting structure put in place by Mislin Tat. It needs clear discussions and decisions between that hierarchy, between Mislin Tat, between the director of football, and that's what Senya he is, whatever his title is, he is the director of football, and whoever the coach is. They all need to buy into that. They need to buy into that way of doing things. And only then will we get a coherent transfer policy. Because at the moment, we've got too many square pegs in round holes. I think we have to be positive about it. I think that Aubameyang choosing Arsenal is an indicator that there is life in this club, that it still has a pulling power. And, you know, we're not in the Champions League at the moment, but Manchester United weren't in the Champions League when they signed Paul Pogba. Chelsea weren't in the Champions League when they signed N'Golo Kante. You can still bring in a big player. Look at us. We brought in Aubameyang. We're in the Europa League. We're not going to be in the Champions League next year unless we win the Europa League. So I think that we sh we've shown there that there is an attraction. But also, let's not lie, the move suited him too. He wanted to get out of Dortmund. They're a very financially prudent club. They probably weren't going to give him a long-term deal on the money that he was asking for. So... It suited him to come to the Premier League and come to London. But now that we've got him, we have to make the use of him. It would be a tragedy if you spent 60 million quid on a striker who's proven he can score goals at the highest level in the Bundesliga, in the Champions League, internationally, and then don't give him the platform to succeed. I've seen that too many times. I've seen Mesut Ozil come into the club. I've seen Alexis Sanchez come into the club. And the following summer, 2015, what did we do? We bought a goalkeeper and no outfield players. We had an opportunity at that time to restore the club, to build a proper team with excellent players who wanted to come and play with Ozil, who wanted to come and play with Sanchez. And yet, what, how many years did it take for us to eventually bring in a centre forward of the requisite calibre, like Lacazette? I think it was three, four years. Not good enough. Not good enough. And we can't make that mistake again. I know that we're down on the squad, but there are players there of outstanding quality. Aubameyang is one, Ozil's another. I still think there's a great player in Aaron Ramsey. I think that there is a core there that you could work with, but you have to surround them with quality. And you need to do that to restore the reputation of the club as well. What made me love this club? The great players, the Burkamps, the Henri's, the Wrights. We need that for another generation. We need totem pole players who can lead this club forward. I think we're down on the squad, but you do have to imagine what might happen if another manager came in. And I look at the situation at Manchester City say or Liverpool. I look at what Guardiola and Klopp have done with those existing players. I look at the way that Jurgen Klopp transformed somebody like Adam Lallana in his first season. He made him into this player who was pressing all the time, who was playing through balls and I thought of Lallana as a bit of a nothing player before that. I do think that you can't underestimate the impact a new coach could have on certain players. Guys like Xhaka, I think it's a problem of role as much as anything else. He's not not talented, he's clearly talented. But he's being asked to play a role in a team that I don't think he's being explained to him properly. I don't think he fully understands it. And I don't think it really makes sense. It doesn't make the most of his strengths. And unfortunately, it highlights his weaknesses. You know, the right coach protects his players with the system. He chooses a system that emphasises the player's strength and hides their weaknesses. With Arsenal, sometimes it feels like the inverse. And I do think that there are players in this squad who really could come on under a new coach and I think it would be a new lease of life for them. You can't question that, you, you, sorry, you can't be certain of how much, how much influence that element has too. Perhaps there's a lack of motivation under the current coach, perhaps they're bored of the same instructions, perhaps they're too comfortable in their positions. I think it's psychological as well as technical. But there are players here who, if we said certain players in this squad for sale, some of the biggest clubs in Europe would be queuing up to sign them. Hector Bellerin, Aaron Ramsey, Meza Ozil, Aubameyang, let me tell you, if they were for sale, all of our competitors would be trying to take them off us. And that tells you something. I also think that we're a little bit quick to dismiss some of the young players we've got in this squad. I understand the anger against the, the poor performances, but there is a really exciting generation of young talent coming through. Bellerin and Iwobi are kind of at the forefront of that. They've already made their way into the first team. But look behind that, you've got Willock, you've got Nketiah, you've got Rhys Nelson. And we're in a situation, we're in a situation with Reese Nelson where, you know, he's yet to sign a new contract with this club, and he's probably the most exciting young prospect we have. We're in danger 
of losing him because he thinks, are my interests best served at Arsenal? That worries me. That worries me a lot. He deserves a lot of credit, Marcus McGrain, because he, he's made the choice to go abroad, to experience a new culture. Look, he's probably not going to break into the Barcelona first team. He knows that. But what, a, what an experience. You know, he'll come back to England if he does, or stay in Spain, a better player, a superior player with his reputation enhanced. And crucially, if he goes into their B team, he's playing competitive football there. We've got a bit of a problem at Arsenal, a bit of a bottleneck occurring where they get to the under-23s and the standard there just isn't good enough. So we need to find a way to get these guys first team football. I think we could make better use of the loan system. If we're not going to be playing Reese Nelson, I don't really see why he's not on loan at another Premier League club or a high-flying championship club getting the game time that's going to see him move forward. I know Arsenal likes to keep a close eye on players, but I don't really understand the logic in that. Similarly, Mavropanos, we signed him in January and the plan was to send him out on loan. Arsene said, no, 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 he's impressed me in training, we're going to keep him. Well, what was the point? He's not played a minute of football. He's a young centre-half. Defenders make mistakes. They need to make mistakes to improve. They need game time. He's not got any in this last six months of the season. He could have done in the Europa League, but he hasn't. I don't understand that. I think we've got a really exciting young crop of centre-halves. I think Callum Chambers I'm less sure about, but Rob Holding, Mavropanos by all accounts is doing well. We need to find a way to see them develop and see them get game time because, you know, if they just sit in the reserves, that's not going to happen. The first thing that has to change is the manager. It's not easy for me to say I've got huge admiration for Arsene Wenger, but that's the first thing that needs to change. You can't sell a squad of 23 players. You can change the manager and see what impact that has. And around that, the structure has to change. We don't need a manager. We need a head coach. We've got a top recruitment guy, we've got a top football executive who's come in, we've got a contract guy to sort out that side of things. Now we need a coach. Someone who's going to be out there on the training field, preparing the dossiers, coaching these players for every game, giving them instructions, because that's how modern football is. Arsene Wenger is a coach who says, go out there, play your game. Well, the modern footballer doesn't want that. The modern footballer wants instruction. He's been in an academy system where he's been told his whole life what to do. You can't suddenly put him out in the first team and say, good luck, son. Run around a bit, I hope you make the best of it. You need more structure than that. So that's the first thing that needs to change. And I also think that what needs to change with that is the fan sentiment. And I, I, I really understand that fans are unhappy at the moment. But I think when a new man comes in, it's not if, it's when, and hopefully it's soon, we need to rally. And we need to understand that it might not always be smooth. It might be a difficult transition. Succeeding Arsene Wenger will not be an easy job for whoever it is. The expectations might have been lowered, but they are still sky high. But we need to support that manager, rally around him, and try and get some harmony through this club again. You know, the club motto is victory through harmony, and that's been widely mocked in recent years because we've been the opposite of that. The infighting in the stands, you know, the, the rows online. That, that needs to end, really, because Arsene Wenger is one of the causes of that. And when he's removed, I hope that will assuage a bit. And I hope as well, when the new manager is in place, that the focus will turn to the board and their responsibility in this situation because, let me tell you, they are culpable. And so far they've managed to hide behind a manager who's taken a lot of flack, some of it justified. But when he's gone, questions will be asked of the board and of the owner. And I hope that continues, I hope that movement builds momentum. Because ultimately, this club is owned by Stan Kroenke, but it belongs to the fans. And I think that the fans need to be accountable to and they need to support the team, support the club and do everything they can to restore those values that are so precious to us really because they are the thing that lasts, not players, not manager, not even trophy success, not even the glory of an FA Cup win lasts. The values are what underpin this club. If we can bring that back then we'll be on the right path. This is what I'll add. I can't wait until I come to the Emirates Stadium excited again. I can't wait till I arrive at the Emirates Stadium, maybe it's next season, and there's a new man in the dugout, and we don't know what we're gonna get. We don't know how this team's gonna set up. We don't know how they're gonna play. We don't know how we're gonna finish that season. We don't know who we're gonna buy. We don't know who we're gonna sell. When there are unknowns again, and possibility opens up, that's what I can't wait for, that buzz around the ground, that thing of people going into the stands, that it will be full. Let me tell you, when a new manager is at helm here, it will be full every week because people will be desperate to see novelty, to see a change. 
and change is coming and I think that's the, the big comforting thing is that it's absolutely inevitable. We are on the precipice of it. And the longest it's possibly going to be is 14 months. I know that's far too long for some, but in real terms, it isn't that long. So sooner rather than later, this is all going to change. And it's no guarantee of immediate success, but I think it is a guarantee of progress. I think we are going to make progress. And I really believe that Arsenal could explode uh, with a few changes. I think there's a massive potential here, both in terms of sporting terms and I think just globally, as I hate to use the word, but as a brand, as an institution, let's say, I think we can grow and grow and grow. We've got this brilliant backing of being in the Premier League, the most exciting sporting competition in the world. We should be taking advantage of that and we should be, we should be really excited heading into next season and I think, I think we will be.